last week our program was on tenacity and we highlighted two people one in the flesh Kasai Hussein uh, an Iraqi refugee with serious uh, physical impairment from a from a, a car bomb and, uh, and a great attitude, somebody who came to this country uh, without speaking the language, with no family nor friends here, no connections here. Uh, he had to learn English, he had to learn how to be blind, he had to learn how to understand the computer that blind people use that talks in such rapid English that I can't even understand it. And then he had to get educated, he had to get a GED, he's now in college trying to craft a career for himself. And through all of this, uh, he had a, a such incredible tenacity to deal with, with those, um, those horrendous uh, 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 events that had, that had so changed his life. And he has a, a wonderful attitude. In fact, you remember if you were here that he said, if a doctor came to me today and said, I, would, I could restore your sight, he said, I wouldn't do it. Because it is my blindness that has enabled me to, to be useful to help other people. Uh, it is my horrible experience that I've gone through that's enabled me to perhaps motivate or inspire others. And so uh, he's been tenacious in, in reaching his goals. The second person that we profiled was John Paul DeJoria, who has been homeless twice, uh, never went to college. He uh, had immigrant parents, uh, divorced when he was two. He was in foster care. Uh, totally uh, impoverished for much of his life and now is a self-made billionaire uh, with a fortune of somewhere between three and four billion dollars. How does that happen? One of the things that he said was uh, know what your goals are and tenaciously work toward them, never give up, never quit and uh, do whatever it takes to get there. When he didn't have rent he picked up bottles two cents a bottle for a little one and five cents a bottle for a big one. He did whatever it took in order to reach his goals. So we probably did this whole thing backwards because today we're going to talk about goals uh, <laughs> that you can then tenaciously work toward. So uh, I, I decided the title was Golden Goals, not Golden Girls. That's old people in um, Florida trying to say, this is Golden Goals. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see this. This is one of my very favorite cards. I have a, a blow up of this at my, at my cubicle. But it, it so perfectly explains my life and many other lives. So uh, this person has uh, two, two charts, personal goals, with a continual upswing to the left of success. And uh, so far, with uh, nothing. Uh, <laughs> So that's how far she's gone on her goals. She's watching TV, certainly a goal buster, uh, and um, eating pizza and surrounded by a lot of trash and a pig. Uh, so um, lots of us in our youth had lofty goals, career goals, personal goals. What is it that you want to be by age 20? What do you want to be by age 30? What do you want to be by age 40? And most of us have not reached those goals. Uh, other things got in the way. Uh, in careers, uh, you all had goals. Some of you have reached your goals already, and you're, on, you're looking now for an encore career. Uh, some of you are in the, in the middle. Uh, Sean said he got sidetracked by uh, a medical situation, and so he, his, uh, his upward ascendancy uh, took a big hit. Boom, nothing for a while. Now he's got to start again uh, in a different direction slightly. So things happen. Life gets in the way, and our goals sometimes get sidetracked. But, uh, and sometimes we just change our goals. What we thought we wanted to do, uh, the, it, was, it seemed so important in, a, in our early years, and it's not important to us now. <clears throat> uh, well, I, was, I just looked him up, and now I forgot his name. There is a, a person named John something. Uh, who was featured years and years ago in Chicken Soup for the Soul. And uh, when he was 15 years old, he heard a friend of his father say that uh, there were so many things that he had always wanted to do 
that he never did do because, uh, you know, life and business and family and so forth. And so he says, do those things while you're young uh, or you'll never get them done. And, and, it, and it got John's attention. Uh, Goddard, I think is his name. Yeah, Goddard, John Goddard. And it got his attention and he sat down and made a list of 127 things that he wanted to do before he died and started immediately to work that list. And I uh, have it with me somewhere, but I don't have it with me right this now. Some of it involved travel. Some of it involved adventuring. He wanted to climb Kilimanjaro. He wanted to climb Mount Rainier. He had uh, five peaks, I think, that he wanted to, come, uh, to climb, including Everest. Uh, he wanted to travel. He wanted to travel the length of uh, the longest rivers in the world. Uh, he wanted to study indigenous tribes uh, in a lot of uh, unusual places. He wanted to read the entire Bible cover to cover. He wanted to read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, cover to cover to cover to cover to cover to cover to cover. To cover. <laughs> uh, so he had, he had lots and lots of goals. Uh, he wanted to have uh, a family. He wanted to marry and have children. Uh, let's see what else did he want. He wanted to fly a plane. Wanted to skydive. He wanted to go into outer space. There were lots and lots of things that he wanted to do. Uh, at the time of his death, at age 88, I believe, and he had added a few more things as he got older, uh, but I believe at the time of his death, there were four things that he had not done, one of which was Everest. I heard an interview uh, with him, and since I had used him in goal setting <coughs> classes before, I was all excited about this interview, and he talked about a time, I think this was when he was, he was uh, going up the Amazon uh, with a friend, and I might have two of his stories mixed up. Uh, the best friend, uh, his boat overturned and he died. So that was one of the tragic things that happened on his adventuring uh, toward his goals. <clears throat> but uh, there was a time when he uh, had appendicitis. Horrible pain. He found some native plants. He was also a, uh, he, he had always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, that was not on his goal list, but he studied medicinal plants and, uh, in the wild. And he had found some plants that were painkiller plants and so forth. Uh, but he ended up, uh, there was, he was by himself. And he knew what was happening was, a, was a, an appendix attack. And he had a knife and he, he uh, did an appendectomy on himself. On himself. And, uh, and then I believe he started the stitching up and, uh, and passed out. And eventually when he came to, he <laughs> completed that task. But he was a tough old bird. <clears throat> so at any rate, goal setting. Uh, goals and tenacity. If you, if you have goals but without tenacity, I don't think you ever accomplish your goals. If you have a great deal of tenacity but you're clueless, you don't have any goals, you're aimless, uh, then, you know, what are you going to do? So you have to have, you have, to have both, I think. Uh, rarely do you reach your goals easily. They always come with effort. They always come with effort. How many of you have seen the movie Castaway? Not enough. Okay, I saw it in the movie theater years ago when it first came out and I liked it, but uh, I stay up late a lot and a few nights ago when I was staying up late, 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 it was on and I thought, okay, I'll just put it on. And it was, it was so appropriate for this particular, uh, this particular talk. So for those of you who don't know, let me give you a real quick overview. Tom Hanks is the lead character. Oh, you can't even see him. That's Tom Hanks. Uh, Tom Hanks is a, is a manager uh, with FedEx, and he's all about time, 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 time. Uh, Lickety split, he, he has this clock with him all the time. He's in Russia talking through an interpreter. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Get those boxes on the, on the assembly line. You know, get them in the truck. Uh, the truck breaks down, and, and uh, he says, all right, get those. Get, wait, these go on the plane. These go on the, in the... It's all about time and the delivery of these packages. Uh, he also has a, a girlfriend, uh, and so he's, he proposes to her, uh, and he says, I've got to go on one more trip uh, with a cargo plane full of boxes, 
and he says, uh, "We'll open open up that ring box on New Year's Eve. I'll be I'll be right back." And of course, the plane uh, goes off course. They get involved in a, in a huge storm. The plane crashes, and he uh, is cast away on a on a desert island all by himself. <clears throat> and so that's what the movie is about, essentially. So uh, there he is, and and as luck would have it, uh, as he's circum navigating the island to try to see is there anybody here, uh, FedEx packages keep washing up on shore. So he's gathering a few packages and every once in a while something washes up on shore that he's able to use. Um, oh, by the way, uh, he makes a big sign in the, in the sand, help. So some of you are somewhat adrift. Uh, you've, lost your, you've lost your way, you've lost your job. Uh, you feel kind of isolated and alone and uh, you're calling out for help, you know, what am I doing wrong? Help me survive, help me get over this. There's lots of similarities between this movie. I hope you'll all try to watch it uh, and keep this in mind. Um, eventually, this is what he looks like. I kind of wish we didn't have the, the bright lights so you could see that a little bit better. So he's, um, he does look buff, but he lets his appearance kind of go to seed, you know. <laughs> He doesn't look like like Tom Hanks anymore, <clears throat> and um, and he's not eating right. <laughs> so for some of you, that's what happens to you as well. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, throughout his time, he's on this island for four years, and throughout this time, every once in a while, new packages wash up on shore. Uh, one of the packages that he opens up has ice skates like he's really gonna go ice skating. But of course he uses every piece of the, of the ice skates, uh, especially the blades that become his uh, cutting uh, implements and so forth and the, and the strings. Every time he doesn't have the strings, he has to make rope. How long does that take? Uh, so at any rate, he uses different things. Okay, so what's the point of all of this? Uh, at the end of the movie, uh, after four years, something washes up on shore that turns out to be, I think, it looks a little bit like, like part of a porta potty, but it's a piece of sheet metal. And he stares at that sheet metal for the longest time trying to think, how can I use this? And he, he envisions a boat, make, using that as, as part of a boat. And so uh, he eventually gets, gets back to civilization uh, discovers that his girlfriend has uh, married someone else, has a child, and, and that whole thing is horrible, and, and he's devastated by that. She was the focus of his survival for all of that time. And he, and he talks to his, his former boss, and he says, there was a time on the island when I was so desperate, I, was, I, I had reached the, the nadir of my despair, and I was going to kill myself. And of course, he had to make rope. And he climbed to the top of his mountain, and he and he tied the rope around a tree that project that jutted out from the mountain. And he tied it around his neck, and he and he took a leap. And the tree broke. <laughs> and at first, he said, "I can't even kill myself. I'm, I I can't even do that. I have no control over anything." And then all of a sudden he had this epiphany and he thought, that's not right. I do have control. I am not going to die alone on this island. I'm going to, if I die, it's going to be because, because I have taken some action. And I'm not going to stand for this. I'm going to do something. And so he said, I just have to keep breathing. I have to keep breathing and I have to keep seeing what washes up on shore. I have to keep breathing. And when, uh, when he's talking to the boss, he says, I didn't expect, Kelly, I think her name is, I didn't expect her to be married to somebody else. I don't know what to do now. She was my whole future. But I'm just going to keep breathing. I, I just have to keep breathing. If I keep breathing day by day by day, if I keep breathing and see what washes up on shore, uh, and how I can use that. And then at the very end of the movie, he decides to deliver this package that came up. Uh, 
and he and he delivers it because he's all about package delivery and puts a little note on it and says this package saved my life and uh, the person wasn't home and so as he's as he leaves that house he's out on a crossroads a dusty road a highway and this good-looking woman in a pickup truck comes along and he's she says you look lost and he says I guess I am and she says well if you follow this road it goes here and if you follow this road it goes here and if you follow this Dusty Road, it just goes where I'm going. And so the movie ends with him at the crossroads. But that decision is what washed up on his shore. When you look for a job, I think, I think it's easy to, to get in despair. I think it's easy to say, uh, I've tried everything and nothing's working. You haven't tried everything. You haven't tried everything. One time I had, in East Texas, I had a client who said he had, he had he said, there's nothing for me. I've gone to every company every company and I said well which ones I've gone to all of them I've gone to all of them they're not hiring nobody wants to hire me what do I do now I came to all your stupid classes nobody's hiring me and I said well which ones did you go to I went to all of them which ones he'd gone to three <laughs> he'd gone to three and he didn't get hired at any of the three and it felt as if nobody wanted him nobody was hiring uh, he, he needed to just um, be open-minded to what else is washing up on my shore. Uh, you have to be open-minded to new things, new ideas. Uh, but you can apply this whole movie to the job search process. There was a nadir, there was a low point in his life, and then there's an epiphany. What else can I do? What, how else can I invent my, myself? Uh, one time I did an exercise with Job Club North and I said, think of three other ways you could make money other than your regular job. Three other ways you could support your family. Three other things you could do. That doesn't mean that you're not going to continue to look for whatever it is. But do you have other options, uh, even temporarily? Uh, keep breathing. I think that's a good one. Uh, see what washes up on your own personal shore. Nothing's going to wash up on your own personal shore, probably, if you stay in your house. Although sometimes you see something and it yeah, on TV, you read something in a, in a book, in a magazine, and it, and it does. It, it opens up another part of your mind, another avenue of, of possibility. But uh, Bob and all of those other folks who say, get out, go to these meetings, go to the Indeed thing, and uh, see what else you can learn about, about their experts in job search. Uh, go to that meeting and see what you learn. Go to a meetup in your career field. Go to a meetup outside of your career field. Uh, get out, talk to people, volunteer. Volunteer, doing, helping other people, doing something that you care about. Uh, and, and just see where it leads. Uh, expand your horizons. Expand your shoreline. If you have a small shoreline, what's going to wash up? Not so much. Expand your shoreline. And maybe more things will, will, um, will wash up that might be useful. And when your goal is overwhelming, when it's too big, what are you supposed to do to that? Break it down. You all know that. You all know that. You break it down into small pieces. Uh, anybody who's ever been in an addiction uh, situation, uh, the 12-step program uh, is one day at a time. One day at a time. And if you don't think you can stay clean and sober for one day, can you stay clean and sober for one minute? Can you do the next minute? Great. Su success. You succeeded. You were clean and sober for an entire 60 seconds. That's huge. What about the next minute? What about the next hour? Can you stay clean and sober for one day? You break it down into small parts. And, um, and if, you don't wanna, if you don't want to look for a job, see if you can, if, can you apply for one job a day? Can you apply for one job a day? And if you can do that for, for a week, then see if you can apply for one job in the morning and one job in the afternoon. Can you do that? Let's see if you can do that for one day. You don't have to do it long. Can you do that for one day? Break down your goal into, into small pieces. Uh, one of the folks who's here told me that when he was unemployed last time, he decided he was going to send out one resume every day. He did it for three weeks until all of a sudden somebody, he applied for a job on LinkedIn and he got it. So, uh, so set small goals, small goals that you know you can do. <clears throat> break them up. Break up your life goals, your big goal of where you want to be down the road into yearly goals, monthly goals, weekly goals, daily goals. Um, I want to tell you about a client that I had named Queen. 
uh, this was uh, years ago, 30 years ago maybe, uh, I used to work a, a service desk. So I helped people find jobs in housekeeping, janitorial work, restaurant work, security guard work, service in industries. And Queen uh, had been a day worker, so she did private home cleaning. And then she told me she wanted to work for a housekeeping service. And I said, fine, it should be easy for her to do that. I don't know if she'd make as much money as she did playing in individuals' homes because she was really good. But uh, it wasn't hard to get her a job in a housekeeping service. And at some point, the, the company said, that, uh, this was in East Texas, and they said they had heard about some special training that was going to go on in Austin. And they said, would any of you like to go down there and take this training? You'll get a certification, but you'll learn how to clean up uh, things after unusual circumstances like fires or floods. Uh, how do you get sewage out of sheetrock? How do you get the smoke smell out of, uh, you know, out of sheetrock and things like that? And nobody from the company wanted to do it. Uh, there, you had to put a little bit of skin in the game. I don't know if the, the company was going to pay for the training, but maybe, maybe the training and the hotel, but you had to pay for transportation getting down. You had to do something. Nobody wanted to do it. But Queen said, I'll do it. So she was the only person who did it. She came down. She went to the training. She got the certification. She went back home. And um, several months later, there's a big rainstorm. And we had an area in, our, in town where the, the, uh, the sewage system was, was poorly designed in a pretty ritzy neighborhood. And so when you had a huge thunderstorm, uh, the, you know, the drainage system wasn't, wasn't enough to, to deal with it. And so sewage often backed up uh, into the area. Uh, and anyway, so homes were sometimes flooded. So the people were livid and they were vocal and they said they wanted the city to buy their houses. Nobody was going was gonna to ever... Uh, buy their houses. They wanted the city to buy their houses. And the city didn't have enough money, but the city said, I tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll, we'll clean all your houses, we'll restore your houses, and we'll put your drainage problem as the, as the, you know, the top on our list of things to do. So they put on an RFP to custodial companies to clean these houses. Well, there was only one company that was qualified to take on the task. That was Queen's company, and it was because of her. It was because she had that training. So they bumped her up into being the supervisor of that project. And so she knew what chemicals to buy. She knew what process to, to go through. So she took over those crews and she got that job uh, taken care of and she made a little chunk of change. And then she came to me and she said she didn't want to stay with that company anymore. Even though you would think her career was on an ascendancy there, she said, I want to go do housekeeping at a hospital. Really? Okay, fine, shouldn't be hard. Got her in a hospital right away. And, um, and so uh, I didn't see her anymore for a long time. Uh, and just before I moved back to Austin, I went to visit a friend of mine uh, in the hospital and in walked Queen. And I said, oh, I'm so excited to see you. You're still working here in housekeeping? She said, oh, no. She said, I'm his, um, I'm his ward nurse. So hospitals very often, if you want to go to school and learn something that has to do with, with the hospital work, uh, they'll compensate you or reimburse you for your, your training expenses if you make at least a B. So she had, through the hospital, become a CNA, a certified nursing assistant, and she had continued in school. She had become a licensed vocational nurse. She had continued in school. She had become an RN. Uh, now she was, she was his ward nurse. And uh, she, was gonna, she was still in school. She was working to get a BSN, a bachelor's degree in, in nursing. And I said, uh, are you finished then after that? She said, oh, no. She said, I want to get a PhD. I want to teach nursing in a, in a university. Yeah. Slackers. <laughs> <laughs> Set goals. Be tenacious. Work your plan. And if you have to pick up bottles, that's OK. Uh, uh, the AMAT guy, this was a client that I had back in 2001, I think, when there was a, the dot-com bust was happening. We had, every company was laying off. 38,000 uh, tech workers were laid off in Austin. And this guy had a SWAT team. He had created a SWAT team, search with a team, of people that he used to work with at, at, at AMAT. He had been a supervisor at AMAT. And um, what they did was they met every Friday. And uh, 
they uh, set goals for the team. So it was like each week we're going to go to two networking meetings, uh, we're going to do one cold call, we're going to do one informational interview, and we're going to send out 10 resumes or whatever. They set a goal for the team. They had an Excel spreadsheet. If you met your goals, your, your line was filled out in green. If you came close, it was yellow, and if you were pathetic, it was red. And then they'd say, what got in the way? What, what busted that goal? And how can we help you get back on track and reach your goals? And, uh, and if somebody just consistently was in the red, then it was like, you know, we're a team. We'll help you, but if you're not, if you're not tenacious, if you're not working your plan, you gotta go, we're gonna bring somebody else on board who, who's dedicated to, to finding a job. And so he said, I hate looking for a job, I hate networking, I hate talking about myself, I hate meeting new people, I hate every piece of this. But I'm very metric driven. And what gets me out of bed on Monday is knowing that I have to report to my team on Friday. And I want to be green. <laughs> Ask Kermit. It's hard. <laughs> All right. OK, so maybe you apply for one job a day. Uh, some goal ideas. I was going to ask you to come up with your own, but it's already 11.35, so we got to quit. Uh, here's some, just some things, some personal goals, and it could be uh, that as you shared your goals, that some of these were your personal goals. Do something every single day that counts as exercise. Uh, climb, up, climb a flight of stairs. Start little. Build up. Do something better. Uh, help one other person each day with their job search. What can you do to help one other person? If you have a SWAT team, it's easy. Look for a job for the, each member of your team. And so uh, you're helping somebody else. Reconnect with someone you worked with in the past. One new person every day. How are you going to do that? You're going to go into LinkedIn. You're going to go into the advanced section. You're going to look at somebody who worked for your company in your department. That's the key word is the department uh, in the past and in Austin. And see if somebody pumps up, comes up and then see where they're working today. Reconnect with them. And, um, and see if uh, there's a possibility you can go to work where they work. Meet at least one new person every day. One new person every day. How are you going to do that? You're going to leave your home. You're going to go places. You're going to strike up conversations. You're going to meet one new person. Uh, everybody's interesting. Everybody has a story to tell. Other goal ideas. Learn a new skill. Get a certification. Go on Coursera. There's a whole page that we added to the handbook of free or extremely low cost training that you can get while you're looking for a job. Learn a new skill. Read a book. Uh, who was it? Uh, Susan uh, Sprague said that this company that she so wants to work for, she saw a thing about their culture, their corporate culture, and the, the CEO uh, is constantly reading books about all sorts of things that might be useful uh, to the company, and then the company, ex they, they talk about it. Ah, what a concept. Read a book. Read a book. Think. Expand. Uh, do something like that. Uh, do something outside of your comfort zone. That doesn't mean skydiving. Uh, it sometimes means getting out of your house and meeting people, but do something that it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, but you know is going to be good for you. Okay. Oh, that's all I have. Oh, no. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. I cannot tell you how volunteering helps you psychologically uh, and experience-wise and networking-wise. Uh, identify a personal goal, a professional goal, and a job search goal. A job search goal is not always the same as a professional goal, uh, but see if you can identify one in each one of those categories, and then while you have a little bit of time, start working that plan. Start working that plan. One small change in your personal, to, toward one little tiny step closer to your personal goal, whatever that is, one tiny step closer to your professional goal and a tiny step closer to your job search goal. And it helps if you have an accountability buddy, a SWAT team, somebody that's, that you're pairing up with in order to um, have your job search. <laughs> Wilson, in Castaway, one of the things that came up on shore was a, a volleyball. And, and he thought, I, there's no way I can use this stupid thing. He had cut his hand. His hand was all bloody. He had cut his hand and he, and he shoved it at that volleyball. And all of a sudden he saw that it, it could be made into a face. And this became his constant companion, the, per, the thing he talked to every day, uh, the, the most important thing in his life his accountability buddy. All right. But it's good for you to have like a person. <laughs>